I'm going to share my screen. And now I'll start with the course. Well, as my colleague just mentioned, today we're going to have a course fully uh, geared to the IPv6 world. This is the second time that we have this course. It's going to be IPv6 only, and we are going to dive into many transition mechanisms. Personally, I'm going to speak of NAT64 and DNS64. However, we're going to touch upon many interesting uh, topics, uh, like 464, XLAT, uh, and uh, etc. And each of them will be will uh, be done together with the laboratory so that you can see that working. So not just uh, to tell you things, but uh, so that you can have a hands-on practice. So you say, well, so that you can realize whether that can be of use to you in uh, the network and to save IPv4 networks. That's what many of us are seeking. So we're going to speak of NAT64 and DNS64. I won't talk about NAT6, uh, the na uh, network access translation. Basically, this is a mechanism that traditionally the address of origin will be translated from a private IPv to a public IPv um, in IPv4. And in IPv6, we also have the NAT concept, and we are going to speak of NAT64 specifically. This is a very brief uh, definition. NAT64 is a transition mechanism specially designed for IPv6 only clients. So, designed for IPv6 only clients, we are speaking of a network where the clients, either with tablets, cell phones, or computers, have only IPv6 addressing not uh, no IPv4. So this solves the problem presented when IPv6 only clients wish to establish uh, outgoing connections, TCP, UDP, or ICMP toward the world IPv4. So here we want to go from an IPv6 to an IPv4 network. That is why it's called NAP64. And from the side of DNS 64, this is why we, we are speaking of two mechanisms. When we speak of NAT 64, very often that goes hand in hand with DNS 64, which is a, a translation at a DNS level. Remember, the DNS is the service that can translate a domain name, www.blacknick.net, for instance, to an IP address. So what does DNS64 do? Uh, the DNS acts as a complement to allow the IPv6 only clients always to have an IPv6 response. So let's see how we uh, set this up. Having said this, please, if you have any questions or doubts, please ask them. We'll be very happy to answer them. We have a Q&A session where there are no bad questions. Please ask, feel free to ask. We have true experts, not, not just me, but uh, Jose from Cuba and Wesley Correa who have deployed IPv6 um, and many technologies. So this is the time to ask. So let's say, explain why NAT64, DNS64 were born. Well, the motivation is the imminent uh, depletion of uh, the IPv4 space that's already happened. Uh, so at present, there are very few uh, there are providers that have very few IPv4 uh, addresses, and some have none, or the growth of clients when ISP has a certain infrastructure, they uh, want to continue to to grow, and if they run out of uh, IPv4 uh, addresses, and they have to go to IPv6, not necessarily IPv6 only. And then, of course, because we have NAT64 and DNS64, and 
we uh, uh, we don't uh, use IPv6 only because there there are many websites and there are many portals that don't work with uh, IPv6 and they're um, still with IPv4. There are fewer and fewer, but they still exist. So there's an undebatable need of clients and platforms to connect that way. So let's talk a bit about translation and uh, some existing mechanisms. Traditionally, the mechanism, the transition mechanisms, the uh, mechanisms available to go from IPv4 to IPv6, there are three types. The dual stack, one that's called uh, encapsulating, that is a tun tunnelizing IPv6 uh, over IPv4, and there are translation mechanisms, and there are several. NAT64 uh, is network access translation is one of them. The idea is to translate, but basically what I want to highlight in this slide and that many people maybe may have dealt is that uh, with a, a, a native IPv4 cannot uh, communicate with a, a completely native IPv6 if there were no translations. I can't have an IPv4 running on a, a, a computer running on IPv4 and uh, and uh, to talk to an IPv6 computer. When you speak, you translate. So the NAT would. Um, with IPv4, if I have a network, it a computer, an IPv4 computer will traditionally what you translate is the source. It leaves my network and reaches the destination with another source. So it, this is a part that is translated. IPv4, IPv6. You cannot do the same thing. IPv4 has a header, which is much smaller compared to IPv6. This generally is a 20-byte header, and this is a 40-byte one. So I can only translate the origin translation because I have to translate many more things. So this is translated in NAT64. Let us now see uh, what takes place from IP4 to IP6, these things are not translated in detail. So you have switching, you have a, a MAC address in origin, one for the router, and you'll have a MAC address at destination. But let us focus on the IP part. You can see here that I have an IPv4 address and I have to reach an IPv6 address and vice versa. If I want to IPv4 reaches IPv6, I want to have it the other way around. IPv6 should answer back. So NAT64, it goes in one direction or the other. These are the ports, these are maintained, and the data is not touched. In other words, the data can be, can be in layer server, HTPC, SMTP, this is not coded. So the important thing is that in Act 64, only unicast packets are translated. This is TCP, UDP, and ICMP. We're speaking about what any common user will require, but it's always good to be aware of this. Then at the same time, because you have an IPv6 network and go to IPv4, the IPv4 public addresses are shared by many IPv6 users. That is quite normal. We're going to see details later on. Then there is automatic translation of addresses using static information. So in the IPv4 world, I could make an IPv4 private address be natted in a static manner with a public address. Static is that that private address will be uh, the same one. And I can do similar thing in IPv6, understanding that in IPv6, 
the pub word public is not used. The word global is used. The most similar to a public IPv4 address is a global IPv6 address. An important thing, if you, a prefix, uh, a known prefix is used, 64 colon FF9B, because this is a well-known prefix, it was born in the IETF world, and traditionally, a slash 96 network is used. And beyond the fact that this prefix is used, slash 96 networks are normally used because basically this is quite simple. You have a slash 96 network and when you add IPv4 addresses, which are 32 bits addresses, we're going to get 128. I hope you are following me. Remember any questions, feel free to write them in the Q&A box and we'll have time for that in a while. So something else about 90, NAT64, the nodes IPv6 only tend to believe, sh should believe that the IPv4 only nodes should be reachable with IPv6. IPv6 only nodes, my mobile phone, my tablet, my laptop, always going to, are going to believe that it is through IPv6. And this is an important part. We're going to do some tests later on to show you the details. DNS 64 is going to create what we call false responses. These are synthesized responses where the host, which does a normal DNS query, once it reaches a DNS 64 server, it's going to receive a synthesized response, a, a PV6 address that is automatically translated from the IPv6 address of the node. This means that it's going to take the 32 bits of the node I wish to reach and going to add the slash 96 that I mentioned early on. And in the same way in which we have NAT stateful and stateless, in this case, I'm going to use a software. I'm going to use one that is called TAIA. Joule is a wonderful software developed in Mexico and supported by LACNIC. And this is another one in order to show you different softwares that can do this type of work. So you have stateful. This is difference versus stateless. Once we have stateless, I can have nodes one to one. And this is what this software does. Now let us see this diagram. This shows how it works. I have something similar to what I had before, but some additional components. I have an IPv4 network, I have an IPv6 network, and let us remember that each of these do not communicate with another one. So basically what will happen here is the following. I have a node in the bottom part of an IPv6 only network that wishes to connect with IPv4 world. So it does a query to www.example.com. This query is addressed at a DNS 64. And the DNS normally would look for the IP addresses, whether IPv4 or IPv6 of www.example.com. Now, what, what is happening? They're telling, the answer is, well, this address, www.example.com, only has an IPv4 address, which is 192.1.1. The DNS 64 receives that answer, IPv4 only answer, and it is synthesized. The final part of this IP address is C00 colon 103. So it's basically this IPv4 address in this format. 
in hexadecimal. But it is exactly the same number. So the client, the IP6, the IP6 only client receives this answer and says, okay, great, I have to connect to this IPv6 address and is then going to communicate perfectly well through this other IPv6 address. So what is happening here? This guy communicates with 64 colon FF 9B colon colon C 00103. And when it goes through the NAT64, NAT64 identifies the destination of 64 colon FF 9B and says, well, that address the destination is an IPv4 address. It removes what is IPv6, it translates the header as we saw earlier, and it's going to leave an IPv4 only header, which is the one that reaches that server and then establish communication. Then for the origin, they don't know that the origin is IPv6, so it communicates in a transparent manner, manner as should be the case. This is a brief animation just just a couple of seconds okay so, let me share my screen once again. This is a brief animation to show how NAT64 works and DNS64 too. So here I have a client that is IPv6 only. These are the algorithms. That's why I wanted to share this with you. So how does everything begin? The client, basically, is going to send a query to the DNS64. And why is this a quad A query? Quad A is a DNS register for IPv6, but it's going to send a quad A only to the DNS server, which is the one that has been cons configured. So the DNS64 does a query and the DNS64 received a quad A response. If, they did, if it received a quad A response, nothing happens. Connectivity between client and server is going to be done in IPv6 without any issues. And the NAT64 will have no inconvenience either. Now, in case only an A record is received, in other words, if the destination only has IPv4, then the DNS64 has to add a prefix. That is why it is very important that the DNS64 and the NAT64 both have to be very well configured and in line with what I put in the DNS64 and that it has the NAT64. Now, the, the NAT64 is going to add a prefix. This can be a well-known prefix or any other slash 96. So, in, to the 32 bits, it will add these these will be added to the 96 bits of the prefix it is using. Afterwards, the DNS64 sends the answer back to the client. And what does the NAT64 do? These are different boxes. It can be the same, but it can be a different box. So the NAT64 says, well, these guys want to reach the IPv4 world only. Now, what happens with the NAT64? When the NAT64 this is a regular router and the DNS64 is a normal server too. 
Que va a ser Tesla will get drunk and to be on Linux. So the NAT64, then, when the client wishes to communicate with a destination, it will realize, the client will realize that this belongs to the NAT64 prefix. And it realize, realizes, because the DNS answer was synthesized in such a way that this is a reply to a query, to a special query. They said, okay, the client wishes to communicate with an IPv4 address, and I know this because of the destination of that prefix. So I'm going to remove everything that has to do with IPv6, and I'm going to send it to IPv4 so the client will be able to establish communication with the destination server, which is a NAT64. So it is a stateless NAT, which is an IPv4 address for an IPv6 address. And then they will be able to search the internet without any issues. So this is one of the things I wanted to share with you. So let's go back to my presentation. Now, I'm going to go quick through this. It's, this is just to, because I want a hands-on thing and I want to show you the transition mechanisms and a very important thing. Everything that I'm saying right now is highly connected with uh, what our colleagues are going to say. So it's very important. If you understand this, it's going to be easier to understand what Wesley and Jose will explain, because they, uh, they both uh, may have, uh, oh, you're going to be working. Um, it's important to see that NAT64 is one thing and DNS64 is uh, another, but usually they work hand in hand. So these concepts are really very important to understand uh, what is coming later. The components, NAT64, server, DNS64, notice that it's optional. That's why I say traditionally they go together, but not always. And then, of course, uh, an IPv6 only network, an internet in IPv4. And of course, if you have IPv4, you're going to have a public IPv4 to access the world. And this I already mentioned. The DNS64 components, the translation from A to quad A, this is very important in the DNS so that uh, the client may always receive a quad A here. Then this uh, an agor um, algorithmic mapping to synthesize. We already saw the operation aspects of uh, the operations of uh, the NAT64 mechanism and efficient use when you have very few or no IPv4, public IPv4. And that's why I, I, this is why we have this course because it's really going to save you. There are many um, uh, solutions, uh, some are open source, others are um, uh, PI, but let's speak of the limitations, the constraints you might uh, may run into. NAT supposes, but not uh, only, uh, traffic of uh, IPv4 or six origin with a mapped uh, IPv4. You use IPv6 uh, prefix with a method uh, of uh, um, algorithm mapping, and this is, uh, I'm going fast because we'd already seen this earlier. I'm looking for important things. Notice that here it says that the component, the DNS uh, 64 component is optional and uh, it uh, works uh, asynchronously and uncoupled from NAT64, but uh, the response needs to be a response that NAT64 understands to be able to go on. Here you have a summary. Notice that NAT64 may be stateful or stateless. It depends on how you configure it. If you use Linux, you can use IP tables or if you see tables, 
to do the NAT or one to one or stateful that can be from one to several. So let's see the demo once again. Let me share the entire text. And we're going to speak uh, of uh, this. Uh, notice this is the, the lab. So all uh, the trainers will have a, a lab of what we are going to use. This is a DNS 64 and NAT64 lab. And to my left, uh, I have an IPv6 only network. And uh, to the right, I have an IPv4 only network. And I want to establish connectivity from the IPv6 only client to a server that is only IPv4. And what I have here, in this case, I have a DNS 64 and NAT 64 both in the same box. However, as we'll see that uh, I may have the DNS here, the router here, no problems. If I wish it some redundancy, then another way is uh, uh, I can have several DNS servers, but it makes sense to have uh, some redundancy. So if something doesn't work, it will still work. So I want the DNS responses to be based on DNS 64 so that NAT 64 can work properly. Okay, so let's... I already started the computer, so you won't need... It. So this is an IPv6 configuration. This is the PC. Usually, in case it helps you, I have uh, the machines more or less in the same order as GNS3. GNS3 is a network uh, simulator, the GNS3. I think that emulator is um, not describing it well because he, these are virtual machines with Linux. I can have many vendors here inside, but here we are all, always using Linux, but the concepts are the same, whatever we use. So let's go to the IPv6 client, the, the PC. If I see that now it has absolutely nothing, it has absolutely nothing, it has a loopback interface. It has a loopback IPv6 address. And I inscripted this to make the configuration a bit easier. So let's see what it has here. Only, so NAT64 SH. And in the first, we raise the ENP0S3, the physical interface, and I'm placing an IPv6 address to that interface. It will have only IPv6. I configure a gateway and a DNS. I configure an IPv6 address. I'm configuring a gateway. It's this interface here, right? And I'm configuring a DNS that corresponds to the IPv6 address of this server, but we're also going to do it and we're going to mount these scripts. And when the video is in YouTube, you're going to be able to pause it. And the last, uh, uh, the DNS that uh, I'm putting, uh, DNS, so name server 2001, well, this. This is the address of the um, uh, IPv4 server and I'm adding it. Remember that in the Unix and Linux uh, address, uh, the DNS servers are listed in this file, slash etc slash resolve.conf. Let's see in the file whether there are any errors. Fortunately, there are no errors. If um, we do an if config, if I have uh, um, an interface that I didn't used to have, that uh, it has uh, here, it has the length of a prefix that is most used in the world of the, the slang. Uh, and I'm giving you a tip. 
Today, at the end of the day, we're going to have a Kahoot with several questions on IPv6. And many of the answers that I, many of the, <laughs> many, I said several times, uh, many answers to the questions in that Kahoot. So if you're going to have paid attention, you're going to do well. And we thank uh, the Netflix colleagues that sponsor Kahoot. So we have configured the client uh, slash etc slash resolve.com and we have only one NS, DNS server at the router level. So, well, there are many ways we can do this. Um, you see that it's a family A in at six uh, RN and here you see that by default, it, um, this is the router of NAT64. So having done this, we finish with a client at, uh, in the configuration. And now let's see the server. I have a small script. I'm going to go a bit faster. Uh, but I want to explain this uh, is uh, a, this is uh, a bit larger because remember that Tahija is uh, the NAT64 network that we have is a stateless server and it's going to create um, MK2 server from Taiga to MK2. We are going to have three physical interfaces. We raise an interface, the, what makes sense. I'm receiving through HTTP an interface to do the resolution of DNS with the real world, and I'm configuring the IP addresses of each interface as appropriate. The, um, and this is uh, to the IPv6 world only. Uh, only word. This is going to be IPv4 only, and I'm putting um, this, the IPv6 address to the NAT64, and I'm creating a route. Here you have the IPv4 and the IPv6 addresses. These are the prefixes. Now we are going to see it well. 192.168.255.0.24. Uh, that has NAT64, and this is what uh, Taiga is going to assign me an IPv6 set. And we have a route of an um, IPv6 um, uh, prefix that corresponds to the mapping. And finally, a DNS service, uh, and I raised this DNS service. And I also want to show that it has a DNS service. So put bash, not 64, sh, this server. And basically what it did, very briefly, confi it configured the IP addresses in uh, this uh, uh, and the equipment, what I need. And at a, a DNS uh, level, let's see. In the file, I put it uh, as a bin name options. And what do we have under options? This is part that interests me, the end of the file. I didn't touch the beginning. So this is all by default. What do we have down here? We have that we can hear this. Uh, it makes sense. But here we have these prefix. The, the DNS64 directive, 2001, DB8, one, uh, colon one, colon FFFF, colon, colon, slash 96. This is what uh, IPv6 clients you are going to synthesize this address when the response of some search of some query is in IPv4. This is what he would be doing. And here you have the directive. This is production class. Very, very efficient. This is what the bind has. Very brief. And Taiga. 
And this is the configuration of the Taiga that has nine, not 64. It has only four lines. It's saying what interface it's going to use and it indicates Taiga what interface to use and not 64, that was the one that we created earlier. And it's placing an IP address to Taiga. That's very important always because remember that this is also for ISMP uh, uh, packages and the prefix for NAT64, that is what is the prefix that when I visualize the box of NAT64 will somehow pass to IPv4, removing IPv6. And the dynamic pool that we have it here with slash 24, this is quite a small IPv6, well, a slash 24 with only 55 uh, IP addresses, it's very small, but for the example, it makes sense. And here we'll see, let's go to the server too. Let's go faster, that's not much to see here. I don't want to leave anything, uh, anything out. And what we do here, is to raise the interface and to put this uh, IPv4 and we add a route by default and we're going to put bash. This is the server, right? And uh, it's running through Apache. So let us see what happened. Let's go to the client. This is the client. I'm on this side. So I'm running out of time. Let us see the beauty of what is happening here. We're going to do DNS queries. Take www.yahoo.com with quad A. And that's an IPv6 address of yahoo.com. So I received an answer. It's telling me, oh, this is the answer section with IPv6 addressing 2001, 499.8.44. Let's see lacnic.net in IPv6. This is the IPv6 address of www.lacnit.net. And this is Google and all the others. Now, this device can only ask for IPv6 prefixes. prefixes. What if I get an IPv4 only client? For example, this destination of Google, which is ipv4.google.com, and I'm ask, I ask for IPv6. And this is magic. I hope you can follow this on the screen. So with Dig, I'm going to ask him for the quad A of a domain or a file name, which is IPv4 only. And I'm correctly receiving the synthesized IP address 2001 colon DB8 colon one colon FFFF. And we had created one that was only for this course ipv4.acostasite.com and you'll also see that this IPv4 only with this 2001 colon db8 colon 1 colon fffff etc. If I get this c0a8 colon 1 this corresponds to 192.1 This corresponds to the IP address of this guy here. And we did this because of the following reason. I'm going to do ping 6 to ipv4.acostasite.com. And I'm getting no answer. But this is a synthesized address and I'm not getting any answer because I hadn't raised the demon, the tiger process. It's tiger minus T. I react, I, I got it, and then bingo, I'm getting the ping. So I'm doing ping at this moment 
and this is connectivity between IPv6 and the client, the IPv4 client. Now, if I go to the server and I do TCP dump slash I ENP OS3, this TCP dump is a sniffer. And this is a CMP packet minus N. And these are the pings. I'm receiving a ping from who? From 192.168.255.234. This is a pool defined by Tiger to map IPv6 to IPv4 in a one-to-one -one relation. And I got the answer and the, re this re uh, the server will be receiving this. I then can check this. We said we had a web server here. IPsocks4.acostasite.com and here we are opening fvarlog Apache. Each access done by Apache, Apache is going to be registered here. I load the page and I hear, I hear receive 192.168.255.234, which will coincide with what Taiga had decided to give to my IPv6 client. This is a mapping. It can also be static mapping, and it shows that 192.168.255.234 corresponds to IPv6, this IPv6. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And this coincides perfectly well what I see, I'm receiving through the TCP dump and in the Apache log. So this is the demo I had to show you. Let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Alejandro, hi, good morning. I'm going to support you with the questions. Well, when you're speaking about the NAT64, Luis Barroyo was asking us what images you use for the DNS64, NAT64 machine and GNS3. The, the devices I'm using for this lab is an Ubuntu, the Mind by default that is installed by ABT and the Taiga, which is a relatively old server, but it works perfectly well. And I've used it in production. And, and if I'm not mistaken, is the 098 version. It's very easy to compile. And um, you can have it in the user space too. It works very well. Jordi Pallet, I'm going to summarize the question. He says, as a recommendation, if you take DNS 642 production to take pay attention to certain things in order to avoid the use of DNS 64 with other transition mechanisms, special addresses for documentation, etc. And he suggests a couple of links in that context. Any comment on that? And any comments regarding security? Well, regarding what Jordi Palette was saying in his first comment, I would say that he is totally right with that. And I'm going to explain what he is referring to. That's great. In this configuration file that I, op file that I opened previously, etc., bind named.conf.options, and this is what he is referring to. He's perfectly right. Here in the DNS 6.4, what we're telling it to any client, to any client, we're asking them to synthesize 2001 db 81 FFFF. And very correctly, Jordi is suggesting to say to the clients, which are those clients who will receive the synthesized prefix in return. 2001, db8, 1, colon, colon, slash 64. And it's going to give a synthesized reply 
when the client comes from this origin. And it's correct to have done this. Very recently, we saw a case of a server that was misconfigured because it had any clients and it was an authoritative server and it was really quite a mess and they didn't have access. But thank you for your comment, Jordi. I appreciate it. Great. Jose, anything else? Let's look at the chat. Alejandro, any question, suggestion on reading for Frida or Microtik? Well, I see the comments that Microtik is the worst option. Unfortunately, I cannot support or contradict that. And somehow, each vendor is strong in certain things. Others are very strong in routing and switching. Others are strong in firewalling. Others in servers. So the interesting thing here is to support, get the support of network operators, for example, from LACNOG. You can get a lot of Nate feedback of people who are using Microtik in favor or against Microtik. In Latin America, there are many, many ISPs that are using Microtik. We also know other vendors that have had problems. Yes, sorry to interrupt you, Alejandra. Yes, for sure. Microtik is what the majority of the ISPs use here in Latin America. So removing the option for Microtik for IPv6 implementations would not at all be feasible because what we wish to have is that more and more ISPs do implementation for, that, for their users. So we're speaking about NAT64 and DNS64, 464XLAT, but the implementations are not just limited to that. There are other transition mechanisms that work very, very well and that have many users. Yes, we're on the same page and I fully agree with that. In LACNIC, it is very odd to have an ISP that we speak with an ISP that does not have Microtik. And I think that Microtik has done an effort. Maybe in IPv6. Everyone is using it. Users that use many gigs. If you allow me, Alejandro, I think it is very difficult, at least from man's standpoint, and also respecting Jordi's position, to say that one solution is totally bad or totally good. In the case of Microtik, it is quite true that some transition mechanisms of Microtik do have some weaknesses, for example, VRF and Mangle and packets. But I do have a lot of experience with IP uh, deployment in Tipon, and some things do work very well, routing and others. So sometimes the only option you have for small ISPs is Microtik. So you have a high-end router can be a bit complicated initially. So yes, it does work in some cases. In other cases, it does have certain weaknesses, but that's like everything. But I must admit that they have made efforts in starting to incorporate things. But for example, some mechanisms such as data centers don't have support. So I think there are issues. This is an interesting point. Yes, Jose, I agree. I started with Microtik in mid-2011 or 2010, and the initial test done with Microtik, well, they have changed many things in the meantime. And Microtik is one of the only options that the smaller ones have. So we cannot exclude the smaller ones from IPv6 implementation because they are the ones that really mobilize the end users. So Microtik ends up having many end users. So small ISPs have many 
more users compared to larger operators. You really cannot exclude these smaller ones from IPv6 implementation because, in fact, they do represent many, many users. And this is, in fact, what we really wish to achieve as many users of IPv6 as possible. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your comments, Wesley. I think Microtech does has made efforts. So IPv6 is being used for IPv6. I think we now have seven minutes until Jose Gregorio Cotua joins us in order to speak. He corrects himself. Wesley Correa will speak for with 464XLAT and we'll stay around. There are many interesting comments in the Q&A section. In case anyone wishes to check that, I see there are several things also on CGN and also there are some recommendations regarding Microtik. Jordi, maybe could you add these in the chat? That would be welcome. So we have a five minute break now. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. I think that there you can see my screen. Could you check that? Yes, yes, we see it. Perfect. Good. Thank you, Jose. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to LACNIC 36. It's a pleasure for me to be here one more year talking about IPv6 to support the ISPs, mainly those that uh, have some difficulties so that they can implement and deploy IPv6 well, precisely because we need IPv6 to reach as many users as possible since uh, the since IPv4 has been depleted in LACNIC. So in this tutorial, we're going to talk of 464XLAT as a transition, as an uh, the, um, IPv4, IPv6 transition. That's me. You will have the possibility to download this uh, presentation and you can check it later. And the motivation of this tutorial precisely is to help the ISPs that have uh, any difficulties uh, running IPv6 uh, presenting the uh, 464X LAT uh, transition technique in an uh, ISP scenario. We've seen uh, many of these uh, um, uh, transition techniques in broader scenarios. So uh, in the smaller ISPs may have uh, problems uh, when trying to use um, uh, 464XLAT. So 464XLAT um, was standardized in RFC 6877, and it's a, a technique that uh, helps um, to route IPv4 packets in an IPv6 only network. And it's very important to understand that the network is IPv6 only, that is between the ISP uh, uh, header and uh, the user's equipment. We have only IPv6, no IPv4. In that scenario, the ISP works as a, a, a CLAT. And we have also the concentrator, the server's uh, equipment that is by the site. So in a summary, um, the 464XLAT is an evolution of NAT64 with the DNS64, uh, and there we have all these solutions that we already saw with Alejandro in his presentation. And uh, his, uh, his presentation was a good uh, introduction, so you'll be able to understand it better, so that you may see how the 464XLAT works. What is the common topology of many ISPs? When I say many, it's because it's not all of them. There are some topologies that are more common. For instance, having only 
an equipment, uh, a machine, or uh, um, a router that are the interface between the ISP network and the residential and the home devices. Why is it important to consider the uh, residential devices? Because they are the ones that are going to generate the connectivity from the user. The use, when the user wants to connect uh, to the internet, they need uh, either a smartphone or a tablet or a computer or a TV. Any device it is important. And the ISP is what uh, does the separation between the ISP network and the home network or the corporate network uh, of a company, for instance. And there we verify the topology. Here we have a sketch of how an implementation of IPv6 would be with 464X LAT in an ISP environment. Here you have the cloud that represents the ISP's network. This would be what is in the header of the ISP. We have the router, access concentrator, we have DNS, we have everything in that cloud. Here I represented two different uh, clouds for IPv6 internet and IPv4 internet, but physically they may all come uh, through, through a single uh, frequency depending on uh, what the operator uses with the radio frequency link. And there, in that uh, ISP, we have what is represented here with the access concentrator. This is what many people know as the BNG. So this concentrator is the what links the user with the outside world. It's what will give the connectivity of the ISP to the user. And here we put a server that uh, is conducting the p uh, uh function. In our laboratory, it will also have the function of, uh, NS of DNS64, but the uh, idea is that they should be a separate server so that we can customize the configuration of the hardware for each different app and, and so that we can monitor the uh, consumption of resources. And the uh, ISP network that is involved in this line here, here it is as IPv6 only between the access concentrator and uh, the uh, user CPE, the CLAT, we have only IPv6. And in the user's network, we have all the devices that are represented here, a laptop, a smartphone, a PC, tablet, among other things. And we see that here in this, uh, uh, segment uh, of the client, we have IPv6 and uh, IPv4 configurations. And why does that happen? Well, because there are still many contents that need to be accessed through IPv4 only, not because of a technical uh, need, but because the owner of the content, the website, the municipality, uh, the government agency, the university or whatever, a bank maybe has not switched, uh, has not implemented IPv6 only and uh, IPv6 and they only have uh, IPv4. So we need IPv4 still. And what 464XLAT does is to take the traffic that comes from the divide in direction of uh, that, the request that comes from the device in direction to the internet, this would be something exclusively IPv4, and sends it through the IPv6 network on the concentrator. Pero esa solicitud, como ya hemos visto por la presentación de Alejandro, this request is done through DNS64, which is a 
resolution through a slash 96, for example, and this generates an IPv6 address, which is fake. It's an imaginary address, obviously, based on algorithms of the literal IPv4 address. So for the router, for the subscriber CPE, what is being exchanged is exclusively IPv6. In the core of IPv of the network, it is IPv6. The only ones who know it's IPv4 is a PLAT and the user's device. They are the only ones who know it is IPv4. So in our simulation in the ISP environment, we use a tool called PNET Lab, which is a great tool for simulations. And these simulation tools are already at such an advanced stage that they cannot only serve as a simulator, you can set up the entire you can set up the whole thing with the distribution and the microtick and everything that can be virtualized, all the addressing. And this is what you use in the laboratory with RB951. 951, this is a gateway. This is, a, this is where I receive the DNS traffic and in the PNET lab, I put all the rest. We have a Linux Debian, which is what we use for the 464X LAT with tool and DNS64 with bind. And we have the open WRT, which is a CPE, which has the CLAT packet with 464X LAT already installed. I strongly recommend open D WRT because it's very simple, it is very flexible, it has everything that is very simple but has many advanced functions for those who wish to do firewalling or other things, as would be with the case of the implementation of 464XLAT and the RB951, we're using MicroTIC. So we are going to use MicroTIC in this presentation and you will see that it is possible to do this implementation even if you use MicroTIC. What are we going to need for the concentrator? We're going to need IPv6 connectivity between that concentrator and the CPE. And for that aim, we're going to use DHCP v6 server, which recently is very mature, very stable. It works very well with MicroTIC. We're going to look at the configuration. We don't have too much time, but we're going to look at the setup, the configuration, so that we can understand how this really works. And then for the PLAT, which is the 464X LAT concentrator for that, we're going to need uh, 1 slash 96 for the NAT64, and we're going to even use the standard range, which is 64 FF9B colon colon slash 96. We're going to need IPv4 addresses available, public addresses for NATing, for converting what we receive through the 64, and to change it to an IPv4 from public origin and with a public port. I don't have one at the laboratory, but we do use a private IPv4 address, which works exactly in the same way. We're going to use the tool for NAT64 and the BIND9 for DNS64. All this basically requires standard configurations that you can find in Jules' website. And I'd like to thank Nick Mexico for that great solution that they have helped, that has helped so many ISPs to implement so many projects with 464XLAT and many more. And the BIND9 is going to use a basic configuration 
that we really have to follow the bind security policies so that DNS services do not amplify DDoS attacks. Please do not do that. That is one of the fears that the ISPs have many of these, that the attacks can be amplification attacks. So all these things can really lead to affecting these networks. And now on the client side, what do we need? We need to have a CPE with open WRT and with the 464X LAT packet. When I prepared this presentation, the 464X LAT packet existed for only a few versions of chipsets and routers. So it's very important to check which is a chipset and the model in order to see whether this is compatible with this packet, because it might occur, and it happened to me already, that I installed the open WRT in the router. I was happy and pleased. And when I want to install the 464 ATLAT, it didn't have the support, and because I don't have that knowledge to be able to recompile this for the router's chip, I really had to use the, use the open WRT uh, router, but without the packet. So for physical testing, I use the edge router, a very small router with five gigabytes for internet, and I follow some tutorials. So with a couple of researching in Google, I was managed to install it. And then managed to install is everything and configure it without any issues. And finally, you need connectivity with IPv6 with the concentrator. That is the connectivity we need. Configuration in the Migratic. In the WAN, we have IPv4 and IPv6. For some of the accesses, it has to be like that. On the LAN side, this is a user's segment between the ISP and the users. This is where I'm providing connectivity to the user. On that side, I have DHCP v6 server delivering ranges of slash 56 to the clients. In other words, just that. In terms of routes, I have a default IPv4 route, an IPv6 default route, and a route for the packets which are received from my subscriber network addressed at 64F9, F sorry, B slash 96, addressed directly to Joule, that is my mailbox. And then it will try to deliver all these packets to the corresponding destination. And when the answers are received to these queries, it will try to deliver once again the answers. So it could be as simple as that. In the Joule, we need, in the Linux and in the bind, we need the Joule. And then the bind, we need for NAT64. For DNS 64, he corrects himself. So these are two standard setups, as you see it in the tutorial, both for Joule and for Bind 9. We're going to set that up and we're going to configure this accordingly. This shows the scenario that you can use for your implementations. Some don't have the aggregation router, others have the BGP border, but the changes are very specific for an, with one implementation and the other, one ISP and the other. But the basis of everything is precisely that. What comes through the internet goes through the aggregation core, etc. 
and this will then move the packets to the jewel and that this has been virtualized in the and this is our rb951 which is here in my office but this will not at all be different the most important thing is our final device we want to have happy cust clients so we want the client to have the best access possible and the client is the main point of our networks we always wish to provide the best connectivity that is why we're always concerned about delivering ipv6 in the CPE, we have open WRT with the packet 464X LAT. And now let us play. So what do we have here? We have our diagram. I will try to enlarge this so you can see it better. So here we will be able to understand each of these devices. The net. This, which is net, is connected to ETH1. This is my uplink. And what I have in the E0 is just a port for accessing a managing management. Here I have IPv4 just for management purposes. And in this segment here, I have IPv6 only. And here, I have IPv6 and also IPv4 between the devices. And this device is one of the most curious ones we have in today's presentation. So let us look at the concentrator at the MicroTIC. Here I am accessing through a private IPv4, which is 192.168.256. There are some important things to take into account. DHCP server, which has already been configured and is in the Ether2 interface, which is the same interface that we see here in the lab. An important thing is an implementation, not, so, not such a new one, but this implementation was what made it much easier to a 464XLAT implementation much easier using MicroTIC as a PNG. It's use radius. The MicroTIC, some previous versions ago, did not allow using this for requisitions of IPv6, but now it is possible. So I can use the MAC address from the subscriber's CPE, and then I can do control. And I'm going to deliver a static IPv6, or it can also be dynamic. So this is very dynamic, but it's very possible to deliver IPv6 statically. I can also assign bandwidth controllers so that MicroTIC can do this. So it made 464XLAC implementation Using much easier. The concentra concentrator of MicroTIC. And here I'm using an, um, an addresser. Uh, and here I have a pool called PD. And it has, look at this, it's so interesting. It has a global range because the ISP is already used 
to give tutorials and trainings in uh, on IPv6 and they gave me a slash for D1 so that I could uh, have these uh, nice tutorials for LACNIC and other companies. So I'm using this range, giving the clients a slash 56. And here I have a rank assigned. So here it shows me that it is assigned. All is beautiful. Very important. Here we're going to use 464. If we're going to use 464 XLAT, we need DNS 64. And that DNS 64, for instance, I cannot, just as I do here, only in the profile of PPPOE, I assigned the DNS that uh, the client needs to get. But in IPv6, I don't have that option. I can't uh, put it. So how can I do that? in the Mecrit from Mecrotic. Um, IPv6, uh, here I left the interface, that is all the interfaces, but you can leave, for instance, only the port that makes the connection between the customer and the DNG. So in that option, I put the options, ad the advertised DNS options and over configuration. So, Mecritic will give the client the DNS that he himself has configured. And where did I find the DNS? IP DNS. Here I have the servers part, the IP addresses, the address IP 6 of DNS 64 is also using a global address. And here in the jewel. Wesley, but we just see the screen where you show the sketch, just in case. Yes, give me a second then. So let's highlight. So this is the address of, uh, here I have the radius uh, configuration that I mentioned, as simple as this. You just check the use radius, we know, you know what it's good for. And in the IPv6 uh, uh, here in this part, I'm going to check advertise DNS and other configuration. Thank you, Jose, for telling me. And hopefully you haven't lost any our uh, information so that this and here ip dns we have the global address of that dns that is in the jewel bind is in the same machine of a jewel doing the dns 64 right so in the part of the concentrator we don't have anything else we don't have to do anything else. So here, DHCP version server, and here in the pool, IPv6 uh, pool, I hadn't shown you this. Here we have an, a global IPv6 uh, rank assigning uh, from slash 41 to slash 56. And here you have the DHCP connector and showing that uh, slash 56 rank range. So here, let's close this and we can go if we need it again. And here, let's, uh, here I have my Debian machine that is operating Joule and also the bind with the DNS64 service. So here I have some commands that I already applied, very simple. You can also find this in the, the website of Joule. It has very interesting um, documentation. This is the very basic to work, to allow the IPv4 and IPv6 uh, to apply Joule and 
to use the net filter and assign this slash 96 that we're going to use and assign the ports of the IP4 address that we're going to use for NAT64. Here, you can see that I'm using a private IPv4, but obviously in production, we are going to use public IPv4s. And here we have the option of logging. There are some tutorials of the Unicamp in Brazil that, that clarify this a bit better, how to use the log or jewel to capture, to obtain the information of what client is using, what IPv6 or what port of IPv4, essentially, if it's the case for identifying users. And here we have Joule that's working. Where is it? Joule starts play. Um, here, let's check uh, Joule starts display. So we are going to see the DNS, let's take a look of DNS 64. So we are going to give more slash etc slash bind slash bind oh, named uh, dot comfort dot options. Okay, so here we have the DNS 64, right? So uh, 64 colon FFB uh, 9B and here it allows everyone of course, post, this is a lab, and that's why I allowed you all, because here you have to be careful, you have to put the filters, the policy within the bind, so you won't allow other IPs to consult uh, this, that this uh, rank should not be available, because if not, it may happen. Sometimes we find default routes in uh, IXPs or Rudel or routes by Google announced by people who are not the owners. So we have to prevent that from happening. We have to guarantee the security of our clients. So here we're going to put the information about our IPv6 ranges that uh, may use uh, um, as uh, uh, 64 colon FF uh, 9B, etc. So now let's look at the router, the, uh, let's reload it, ready. I'm uh, in the interface part, very simple. I have one six that has the DH CP version 6 protocol and with the packet, let me show you the packets here, software and system, I put software and here I have all the packets available for installing and I have installed 464XLAT, right? So that, uh, um, if I want to install here in the filter, I need to put a 464X slot and there I can install it, no problems. And again, in this main screen, I have a uh, version six client and I have the X slot just by adding a new interface. And there I can assign the protocol, 464X slot. Uh, only here, by, because by default, XLAT is already configured for this. So I just want to configure and need to configure here, as Alejandro showed, if I want to change, if I want to use another range, another length, if I want, I don't want to use slash 96, but other size, I can um, uh, use it. And if not, I use just the standard. And obviously here, the configuration of uh, the DHCP version four, here everything is configured and by default, it uh, comes uh, here, as well as the assignment of uh, IPv6 addresses to the internal segment of the user as required, as demanded. So very, very simple. 
So here at our lab, let's see the user's device. Let's here download this. Uh, this is one of the advantages of the PNET lab that uh, it allows me to have direct access to the virtual machine at the lab without having to install anything else. So let's give uh, the password. And let's open that. So it has something, uh, uh, there's something open here, but let's see what's interesting. Configurations of the network. These are important things for us that are trying to implement IPv6. So when here we look for the network, here we have the IPv6 address and we have the IPv4 address, the default route and the IPv4 address that has been assigned that our router has been assigned. So let, let's test it. I want you, for instance, here I have this site, abc.com.py. This is a site that works only on IPv4. And we can check, I don't know whether now they have IPv6, but we have some other sites just in case. So let's try with Debian. Let's enlarge this a bit. Uh, I feel, I think that you'll see better with larger fonts. So let's play with dig. www.abc.com.py at 8.8.8.8. And here we have the two IPv4 addresses. And now we'll consult for the quad ah, A. They have IPv6 addresses already. And so I know that both IPv4 and IPv6 work. So now I can't say through which IP that went through. So let's look for a site that may only enable IPv4. Let's try dig ipv4.google.com in the front that is the DNS of Google. And if we give a quad A, there's no information of IPv6 for that. So this domain, this IPv4 domain dot Google dot com is available only in IPv4, only IPv4. And there we highlight that between my computer and the router, I have IPv4 and I also have IPv6. However, between the router and this, uh, I have only IPv6. The default, the IPv4 default route is the one that sends through the XLAT. And so here we can uh, try that IPv4 domain, uh, ipv4.google.com. I know it's missing. I wrote it too fast. And notice that even if I don't have any IPv4 here, the site is working. And I can check here in Joule whether I give a Joule start display. And here you see that we use the screen here and this. We reload again, and there we can see 336-0013362119. So Joule is working. It's receiving the packet that's coming from my internal network with uh, X, this. So the conversion is doing 
be done to IP before the netting, so this packet can exit and return again. So this shows us that it is perfectly possible for a client to access sites and domains that are IPv4 only. I did a small test, dig www.telecomt.net. This is a domain that I normally use for certain things. So I think I removed the IPv6 access in order to have a domain for testing purposes. So this teleconti.net is a domain of my company and I only use it for readdressing and it's only available in IPv4. So I'm going to enter this address. It opened perfectly well and now I have to click here so it doesn't do automatic readdressing. So once again, we need to run. And the latest version we had of received packets was 336219. So let us see what we see here. 337219. So it continues receiving packets. And if I continue with this page, it will be automatic, do aut redirecting, readdressing automatically to the website, which is, which has both IPv4 and IPv6, and everything is opened normally. So for the client, it is totally transparent. The client doesn't know whether the client is using IPv4 or IPv6. They just know what corresponds. They, I have internet, internet is good, even though my ISP is not so big, even if my ISP is small, and even if my ISP uses MyCritic. So let, let us now let us look at this Android. This Android part is a tablet. It has the OS of our tablet of a tablet. And the curious thing of this Android is that it doesn't work with IPv6. I don't know why. Somehow this just does not work. So it made me somehow laugh because the curious thing is that we are here trying to understand and generate compatibility with the older devices that don't have IPv6 support because I cannot force a client to change the devices or to sell the mobile phones, although we are aware that for quite some time Android and iOS and other operating systems for mobile solutions already provide IPv6 support, but it can happen. So he will do a couple of tests on this tablet. I some, have some open tabs here already. One is Teleconti training, which has IPv4 and IPv6. And in that case, it's going to open because it will be working on IPv4. So that more specifically. Now I'm going to show you ip4.google.com. Okay, it works perfectly well. And ipv6.google.com, which has one single quad A entry. And this shows us, what does it show us? It shows us that with a 464x LAT, we can generate full compatibility even with the older devices that don't provide IPv4 support. Whether a smart TV or just any device, I will continue having connectivity to the internet even though my device does not have IPv6 support. 
because as we checked, IPv4 works perfectly well. This site that works with IPv4 runs perfectly well. And once again, highlighting what happens between the concentrator and the CP of my customer, I have nothing on, of IPv4. LACNIC cannot provide me IPv4. I cannot pay $25 for each IPv4 address, which is the current price, October 11, 2021, if I wish to buy that from IP brokers. So I will have to accept a slash 28 or a slash 25 that will even provide me the dedicated link and will also deliver me the software. So basically, that would be all from the laboratory. But I wanted to show you one more thing. This is something that I'm always asked about. And sometimes I tend to forget to clarify this point. Each IPv6 implementation has to be for be followed by a good project, a good planning regarding the use of IP addresses. And everyone asks me, what can I do for that purpose? I use a PHP PAM, PI PAM. I use a virtual machine and I have the opportunity of preparing all the documentation I wish to have for IPv6. In this case, I can add a subnet. I'm going to include the range provided by LACNIC and the name, and then I can use the options to generate small parts of this subnet. For example, assign a slash 40, and I can do that. This is block slash 64 client, etc. So for that one, I'm creating slash 64 to PPOE clients. And I don't recommend delivering this slash 64 for PPOE clients, but this one is used for point to point connections between the PEA, CPE, and the concentrator. And I use this because some CPAs are not compatible or don't provide support for using an IP address that comes from the prefix delegation and take one IP address and put a sub personal sub address. In that case, I would not have access, IPv6 access to that router, to that CP. That is why I also assign a slash 64 block, which serves the sole purpose for managing the CP that IPv6 device. And this also offers many more functionalities like VLAN, documentation. I'm also preparing another training. And here I can document what I'm going to use in that training activity. This is for CGNAT, and this is for IPv6 ranges, and this is a fake range, like I included this as a fake range which I received from LACNIC. This was so that it could be understood by the students, because of course LACNIC wouldn't be delivering a C this uh, type of uh, package. PHP IPAM, if you have if knowledge on Linux, you can set this up and it also includes a demo for testing purposes. And with one or two commands, you can easily set this up. So with one or two commands, you already have this ready and you can start right away to document the IPv6 ranges that are used in your network, because that is very important, particularly so as not to have over IPv6 overlapping. So 
this prevents all those situations from happening, duplication, etc. And these things can be perfectly well avoided in this way. So that would be all. Are there any questions? Yes, Wesley, I will help you with the questions. Emiliano Rodriguez makes a comment, and this was your reflection regarding the CLAT component in the CPE. In your case, the CLAT goes in the CPE, also with the end user. But tell us about the support that you have seen regarding the CPEs, particularly in Latin America, and for the CLAT for this transition mechanism, because he was stating that only limited support was provided for CPEs in Latin America of the CLAT mechanism. Yes, I fully agree with what you're saying. And there's practically non-existent support, but there are solutions for this. The solution that I find for this mainly for the small ISPs that have limited power uh, purchasing capacity is so that they join together and ask a um, vendor for compatibility. So I have some experience with 464X LAT implementation and a friend, a colleague from Argentina addressed the vendors and said, well, we need this. I can purchase X amount of CPEs every year, and if you cannot help me with that, I have no other option but to find another vendor that can respond to my request. And this is more than a request, it is a need. So then they manage then to do the full implementation of the firmware, and they even prepared a firmware that was compatible with other CPEs that they had. They used DOCSIS, so it was very, very simple. With just a few commands in the DOCSIS concentrator, this was possible. So they did programming so that the update would be massive overnight. So all this firmware with 464 LAT and with CLAT could be distributed to all the devices that were on at that moment of the update. So the only way today is to place pressure so that they can generate more compatibility. So if all the CPEs could have the open WRT, that would be the best solution at all. If you allow me to make a comment, let me remind you that the 464 LAT mechanism, both in the CLAT component, has not be only been conceived for positioning this in the CPE, but can also be used by servers in data center scenarios. So IPv6 only things that wish to reach IPv4. Um, this is provided. Yes, thinking about that, I now remembered the possibility of a company that has many devices and doesn't need to put a CPE. This can be done with a virtual machine, for example, implementing CLAT with a Linux and doing that in that way. So these are some of the options we have. I, I have a question of one of the colleagues who says, how do we deliver IPv6 with a DHCP? Could you tell us that? That is how they can get their IPv6 address. Well, from the LAN side, we don't use DHCP. And there are there's even ma training material of LACNIC. We can use DHCP, but DHCP doesn't has one support for each device. A, a smartphone, for instance, does not have a support. So what do we use? 
we use the router advertisement that is a, a bit part of a neighboring discovery that discovers the routers and requests an IP address and the router assigns it through for, for discovery protocol. Uh, so, but usually we don't use DHCP in the LAN segment, but the router advertisement, and that is standard. Here, you see that automatically it uh, has this function of assignment, IPv6 assignment, and that is done through the standard in the routers. Most routers, uh, I found just a few routers that were more expensive, that had that function of a DHCP server to give from the LAN land side of the client. But most with support of the device, they use the router advertisement. Well, thank you. Basically, those were the questions we had. Let's see, here we have another one. I'm going to read it. Are all the IPv6 addresses reachable from the internet or how could I restrict that, for instance, between two points independently of the firewall? That's the question by Rock, Rockham. Yes, all the IPv6 addresses are reachable, but of course addresses like 2008, uh, these are doc DB8 our documentation addresses that are for the lab. So it's not recommended. Once the IPv6 um, is using, you can eliminate that behavior. IPv6 came to restore the possibility that, ev that all the internet devices may be reasonable end to end. So in that case, if you want to restrict you have to do to firewall. Yes, please uh, let me add a comment. We have to remember, it's very important what Wesley is saying, that in IPv6, the idea is to use global IP addresses, that is the public addresses. And we need to remember the, that the original spirit of the internet are end-to-end -end connections and absolutely with no intermediation unless it's at an application level, but the IP should not have it as we there, there are in IPv4. Um, uh, and uh, IPv6 recovers that original spirit. So Wesley, there are no more questions here. So thank you. If anybody has any questions, you would have five seconds. If somebody wants to open uh, the floor, I think that this would be the time. If not, Wesley, thank you for your presentation. Well, thank you for being here at the tutorial. And I'm always ready to answer any questions you may ask me in the social media. You can contact me. My contact, my, my email is public. So thank you. And I'll be ready to answer any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for welcoming me and... Uh, for the introduction. I'm going to share my screen so we can start with my presentation right away. I think you see it, right? I was asked to speak uh, of the SIT data center transition mechanism as part of uh, the transition mechanisms focusing uh, IPv6. So what are we going to talk about? I'm going to divide the presentation into three parts. First, I'm going to speak about uh, the philosophy of uh, IPv6 only, make some comments. Then I'm going to talk about the technical part of SIT data center, the mechanism, the architecture, the, the technical aspects, and to compare it uh, uh, with uh, what uh, the previous speakers have said. And then we're going to have some uh, hands-on exercises so that you can see it working. And we're going to have time for questions. Just as uh, uh, NAT64 and uh, 464XLAT, uh, SIT data center is adds to the solutions for connecting the client server connection uh, the uh, clients that are IPv6 only and that wish to establish connection with IPv4. There is a debate as to whether it's better to go through IPv6 only 
pathway or a dual stack. I believe there's no unique um, uh, answer. I don't uh, want to be adamant about this, saying that this philosophy is better than the other. I think that there are certain settings where one may be more convenient than the other. In the case of IPv6 only, I think that there are some cases where it's not so simple, or there are some elements that you need to consider to discard dual stack. And, that, and that's what I want to talk about. One is deploying the platforms of data centers to serve the internet, and also the cloud platforms, mobile networks, the internet of things, uh, or uh, um, uh, massive bulk networks such as GPON. And we can have uh, uh, millions of users and having a dual stack network may have technical issues. So in some cases, fortunately, uh, there is a trend uh, that is uh, um, that, well, and now um, things are readier for IPv6, but in some cases it's better to go through IPv6 instead of continuing to deploy uh, IPv6 only. Basically, this is because the dual stack mechanism suggests a number of elements that need to be considered, including planning, reinvesting time in the deployment, the man the management of uh, the network for having different protocols, uh, uh, some issues of efficiency and uh, the responses. I, I want to give you a very specific example where deploying IPv6 only may lead to greater efficiency than a dual stack. And that's the case of the data centers, not necessarily where you have service uh, requirements of service where not necessarily do you have to be exposed to the internet and I can apply techniques and precisely this mechanism of seat data center um, uh, allows you to use uh, the very little resources of IPv4 that I have is uh, more efficiently. You'll know that a slash 30 has for IP addresses and when I assign a broadcast and families, I can use only one. And one of the things that you'll see is that with this mechanism, that same slash 30 can be used more efficiently if uh, I go to an infrastructure that is IPv6 only. So this is just, um, well, speaking of mechanisms that are focused uh, to um, serving IPv6 only clients or servers. This is one of the greatest tendencies now. Now, let's talk of SEED data center, SIIT data center. What is it all about? We are talking about that together with the mechanism that we have already studied here, the thing is to allow through the, this deployment, the interconnection, the communication between devices that are in a network that continues to be IPv4 only, and for some reason it's not available in IPv6. It could be a private uh, network or um, uh, the same internet that couldn't go to IPv6. Uh, uh, or I may have a new network that is IPv6 only as a mobile network, a client uh, or a GPON access to network, or it could all be just a data center where I want to place servers, where I want to deploy IPv6 only. So there are many different scenarios. So now, if I have these two networks and I want those two networks to continue to communicate, remember that natively it's not possible for an IPv4 only device to read IPv6 only. So if so imagine that to the right you have servers and to the other clients or the other way around because different from a NAT64 that uh, tries to solve problems both ways. Here it's the mechanism says if we introduce a new element that uh, in the SIIT data center we're going to call it the SID data center border relay that is a new element such as flat and uh, this is called border relay 
it's a special router. And I'm going to be able to, from this mechanism, I'm going to enable clients in IPv4 to access services that are available in IPv6 servers. And IPv6 only clients or servers will be able to connect with servers or clients in IPv4 only. You know that there's still a big gap in terms of parts of the internet that continue to be IPv4 only. We've grown a lot in recent years. Still, there's a great part of the uh, internet and we can't deny it that continues to be IPv4 only. And this is why this mechanism is so important. This is the architecture. Now, what happens? This is done with several characteristics. One of them is that this component, let's call it the SID data center border relay, uh, is going to work operate as stateless it won't keep a record of uh, the uh, sessions it's just going to work at a pack packet um, um, uh, it's going to have a connection toward the ipv4 side here i symbolized it as an interface and he and another one to the side of ipv6 and precisely thanks to this I'm going to enable communication from IPv4 to IPv6 and the other way around. Whatever no, the direction, depending on how I configure it. It's very important for you to remember this aspect as I mentioned down. Is it possible to map the entire IPv4 space within the IPv6 space? Yes, but it's not possible to map all IPv6 within IPv4. This means that all the internet may connect to a server that I put in IPv6 or a group of servers or a group of uh, apps. But uh, it's not possible with this mechanism. Some uh, servers in IPv4 to serve the entire IPv6 network. So, in spite of the fact that this mechanism operates both ways, the idea is essentially this philosophy. That is, that IPv4 version may see uh, full IPv6 uh, services, but with some limitations that IPv6 uh, to start the connections toward IPv4. Of course, all the connection um, as, as space is um, still um, available. And this is the core philosophy of this transition mechanism. Now, this transition mechanism, it's a, an evolution, solves some specific uh, things. Uh, and these are three essential um, examples. One is the packet headers translation that is solved with RFC 6145, and now there's a new version in 7915. Seven, this continues to be the same because you have to go with the headers from uh, 4 to 6 and 6 to 4, and that hasn't changed. And then we have the address mapping because there needs to be a relation between IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. As Alejandro said, RFC 6052 shows with the use of how to use the prefixes. And now with this new mechanism, you can use explicit routing tables where somehow I'm going to define the change from IPv4 to IPv6 in terms of addressing that is the core of this transition mechanism. Now, here you have the map of the RFCs. This mechanism philosophically is uh, collected in RFC 7755, but it depends on two key pillars. Uh, two of the previous mechanisms and what's new is this here, that is the table and prefix based uh, routing. So going to the mapping, Alejandro mentioned this. Uh, I just want to give you an example. Alex Alejandro also told you that you can use prefixes from slash 32, slash 40, slash 48, 64, respecting some specific issues. The most common is to use slash 96 uh, prefixes, but you can use any. And in spite of the fact that usually we use uh, well-known prefixes, you can also use 
prefixes selected from the prefixes that uh, Lacknick assigns me. I'm going to use that example in the final exercise. So, for instance, if I have this IP address that is written in hexa, um, hexadecimal, you know that in IPv6 everything is in hexadecimal, and I have this prefix and I want this IPv6 address to be mapped, no, this IPv4 address to be mapped within the IPv6 address, you, Following the use of this prefix, that is a slash 64, the resulting IPv6 address is this one here. So this is uh, uh, um, following the rules. Uh, uh, I recommend you to see the standard carefully and to uh, uh, drill it several times because it's very easy. Now, that is about mapping the so-called the mapping algorithm that is the same as in the previous uh, cases. As to the headers conver conversion, there are other elements to consider because uh, the headers of IPv4 and IPv6 are not the same, that you add some fields, you delete others, and there are rules to define how the fields change from one side to the other. Chequeo de errores. Hay unos detalles que tienen que ver con There are some details that have to do with the headers of IPv4, and this is all dealt in the RFC 6145, and this includes some details regarding the extension headers, and IPv4 has 20 bytes and IPv6 has 40 bytes. So there are some details there that I won't expand on, but this is resolved with that mechanism. And now this is the new things. This has to do with the tables. I included here this technical file, including the most important things of this mechanism. This shows the RFCs, and this only has one component, IP4 and IPv6 devices do not need adjustments. So I need a, I don't need a new functional component in IPv4 and IPv6, it's just a new element which is added. And IPv4 continues speaking IPv4 and IPv6 continues speaking IPv6. This is addressed at packets, there is no session registration, so the performance of the router is works at uh, packet speed, translation is prefix based and in tables. It can use well-known prefixes or it can also use prefixes of the slash 32 assigned by LACNIC. Of course, there are recommendations for when to use one or the other. And one important point is that the entire traffic has to go through the translator. This is important and this leads us to consider some routing issues. If I want to go to IPv6 from IPv4, I have to route traffic through the translator. This mechanism, tra this transition mechanism does not work. We would have to do some adjustments for directly connected traffic. All the traffic has to be routed. routed. It can be combined with DNS 6.4. And basically, the three main features are high performance through stateless, table-based translation, and high performance. So basically, that is a technical summary of this mechanism. Now, look at, look, let us look at this mechanism and how it works. The first thing that I would like to mention is that the entire traffic has to go through here. There are two networks that wish to connect to one another. It can be a data center with the internet, an IPv4 data center, and an IPv6 data center, some IPv4 applications that I wish to access from an IPv6 server. Jose, sorry to interrupt. Could you please turn off your camera because the background is interfering with the image? Thank you. All right, so the first thing stated by the mechanism is that the IPv4 packets to IPv6 will be translated without affecting the payload. 
So most of the pilots won't have any problems because the translation only takes place at the level of the headers and the addresses, both from four to six and from six to four. And the translation will be table based. Translation are go in one direction only. They are treated independently. And whenever I wish to establish com communication from four to six or six to four, this has to be done independently. This is because it is not session based translation based on these tables is very similar to the routing process. This has to do with the use of the masks and the length of the prefix, prefixes. Four to six routing can be customized. In other words, I can tell this router only translate these packets. For example, only SSH traffic or HTTP traffic. So somehow or other, this does match in with some of the firewall elements. So let us have a look at this process. And before doing an exercise, I will then show you how all this was configured. Now, the most important thing to remind you or to take into account is that if we solve the translation part of the headers and the mapping, the issue we still have pending for this mechanism is how the IPv4 mapping is done with the IPv6 addresses. I included a table here so that you can rapidly summarize what can be mapped against what. So if you have an IPv4 device, IPv6 device, sorry, with a slash 28. And if you want that IPv6 device to be viewed in the IPv4 space, you only need an IP in the IPv4 world. If you, for example, have a 200 network uh, server network in IPv6 and you want these servers to be viewed in IPv4, these can be represented through a slash 120 group and then re represented with a slash 24 network in IPv4. A slash 128 network can be represented by a slash 29 IPv4 network. Now, the important thing has to do with the suffixes. IPv4 suffixes have to be smaller or equal than IPv6 suffix. If I have a slash 64 I, uh, suffix, as a V4 suffix, this can be done with a slash 24. So there are infinite possibilities. The only limitation is that in IPv4, I will be unable to map the entire IPv6 space. This is because IPv4 only has 32 bits and IPv6 isn't, does not as many more. So what I have to do is to fill out this table with static configurations that have been previously defined. And once the traffic arrives, the traf the device will convert this. How does this conversion, pro conversion process takes place? When an IPv6 packet arrives and this packet enters into the space of packets that have to be translated, the algorithm that has been defined in the new RFC as part of all this architecture takes the IPv6 packet. It looks for the prefix on the table that matches this best and has the largest prefix length. It obtains the suffix and annexes this to the corresponding prefix prefix on the IPv4 side. So basically, every IPv6 packet that comes in and finds representation here will have a representation in IPv4. So that IPv6 packet, and more specifically, that address has a representation in IPv4. It is important to state that once the packet reaches the translator, the two addresses have to be translated, the origin IP address and the destination IP address, because the translations are independent one from the other. So I do, I go twice to this table, one for the origin IP and one for the destination IP. This is when I receive an IPv6 packet. When I receive an IPv4 packet, it is a very same table, but it is 
then in the opposite direction, I go through the IPv4 table, I see which is the corresponding IPv6 prefix and it exit is in IPv6. So the devices works in one direction, changing IPv4 packets to IPv6 and vice versa. But this translation has to be defined previously. Let us see an ex let us look at, at an example so this is clearer. Let us assume that what you see here is the table that I have defined. I'm going to do an exercise with the table already available, but otherwise you have to design it yourself. Let us assume that we already defined this table and let us assume that we receive an IPv4 packet in the space of those packets that are feasible of being translated. I'm going to take just one address, the destination or origin. You have to do this twice. So this is the origin IP address 10.0.9.75. So the device says, all right, I have to translate this. It will go through this table and state, well, which of these prefixes can be matched with this IP address. So if you're familiar with routing, you will realize that that IP matches with this prefix. So you then, okay, I already obtained a prefix. Let us go over to the IPv6 side. This prefix has to be mounted on the corresponding IPv6 prefix. So it selects this prefix. And because it is a slash 24, it does the longest match. It takes out the prefix. It takes away the 24 bits. It has 75. This is IPv6 prefix. And it just adds the IPv6 part, maintaining the zero of the 64 bits, and then adds the 48 prefix, which is the equivalent from the IPv4 side. So this IP, according to this table, leads to this IP address that is the one that corresponds to it. So this is what it what happens. It takes the IP and then generates an IP. And this is done twice for the origin and for the destination IP. And then it is sent to the routing plan and the packet is forwarded. If you get an IP that is not included in the table, it is discarded because there is no entry. I do not proceed. This is just an example to show how this mechanism works. This mechanism can be used in several scenarios. I'm going to show you two or three scenarios so that you can see that this has not been designed just for one type of platform. It can be used in different ways. I personally use it a lot and I invite you to start using it because it is really most efficient and works very well with some limitations, of course, but we don't have to conceal some of the realities. But one interesting example would be the following. I have an IPv4 data center, another data center, and the provider provides IPv6 transport. So I can include a border here and send, send this IPv4, pass, change it to IPv6, it transports it at, as IPv6 and then reaches the other border and translates it to IPv4 at the other end. So what I managed to do is that this IPv4 data center can see this other IPv4 data center and they can view one another transparently without realizing that this was transported through an IPv6 network. It is quite common today that the interconnection providers include IPv6 within the transport platform. I can do it in the other way around. I have an IPv6 data center and another IPv6 data center and the provider does transport in IPv4. So I can do translation, I transport, and then translate this once again. I call this transport, translation, transport. Now, the scenario that I find most interesting is that scenario in which, well, this is an observation, this is a comment which I encourage you to really uh, keep. The transition mechanisms are not excluding. They don't exclude one another. If you use this data center, this does not mean that in that device you can use 464 XLAT and even 464 uh, XLAT at the same time or NAT64. So, for example, I can have a server in IPv4 or IPv6 only. He corrects himself, and I can say, well, on one hand, 
you will have queries coming from the IPv4 world. And if what I want to do is to host an application to which IPv4 clients wish to have access, I use this with the SIT data center. But SIT data center is more effective. But if at the same time I wish that server accesses servers of clients, for example, for repository purposes or GNSs that are IPv4 only, or to download from provisioning assets in a server that is still IPv4, then at the same time in which I deploy SITDC, I deploy NAT64 and I can access IPv4 servers, but I do this through NAT64. And because I work with prefixes, this prefix is f for the SIT data center and this other for NAT64. So you can have the two working simultaneously. And finally, if this same server has most of its traffic, which it can continue responding to, it can be the IPv6 clients at the same time. So, in other words, I can have SIT NAT64 464X LAT, which is a variant of NAT64, which NAT64 could not solve, and then you have SIT data center, all in the same scenario and everything integrated and everything works in the same way. One of the interesting things about SIT IT data center is that the IPv4 space is seen in the IPv6 space of the ISP as a prefix. This is something that has to be handled cautiously because this means that if there uh, um, is a malicious IP and IPv4 and attacks me, I will see that attack in an IP that belongs to the ISP, so I really have to be careful regarding with the ISL, ISLs and the firewalls because I might see malicious traffic belonging to prefixes that belong to me. So my policy is that this might be happening. So we have to be careful about that. Atrévase a utilizar los diferentes mecanismos para solucionar problemas. So the problemas. message is, you can use the different mechanisms to solve specific problems. Each solves a problem or a situation in a certain way. You may decide which is the most convenient, but uh, knowing that you can use them even at the same time. So, so we completed the use cases for using it and some details before we go to the demo it is true it is true that uh, the uh, that um, it has there's been a delay in uh, some uh, vendors for instance microtech doesn't have city data center we must uh, admit it hopefully it will it will come because we had to solve it with linux and in other vendors too i and un i understand that they're coming so there are some details, for instance, a translation uh, from four to six when I have a packet that is around uh, 1500 bytes and I take the header and put it one uh, 40, I may have problems there with the MTU. But the most important thing of SID uh, Data Center is this in terms of its constraints. Because we must admit that no transition mechanisms is perfect. They solve problems, but uh, they, there are issues that we have to solve. For instance, one of the things that SIT Data Center doesn't do is that it doesn't touch the payload of the packets. And if there is an app that needs the content of the payload to work, for instance, the SIP protocol with RTP, where the contact uh, info of uh, the uh, subscribers come to the payload, then maybe in the payload uh, it is bringing an IPv4, but the header brings an IPv6. So there may be things that a telephone may uh, register, but not make any calls. So you need to solve this. And there are solutions for that. There's also the case of DNSSEC, a bit more complex, but DNSSEC as uh, it encrypts uh, it inf uh, coding information with in con uh, payload contents, the DNSSEC in some cases may fail. 
But remember that IPv6 go through IPv6, so there are solutions. The other detail that SID Data Center has is that uh, the tables need to be configured statically. I haven't seen any integration of SID Data Center with routing and with IGP, and it would be interesting to work in that direction that it is translations be done as they, the border learns the route, because if not, they are not transferred to um, IP4. That is still static, but the mechanism exists. And it's likely, well, so before we go to the practice, it's good for you to know what is solved by each. I can say that there are four paths that you can take at the same time. That is to, st to st remain in IPv6 only, and you won't uh, be able to do uh, binding. NAT64 solves reaching IPv4, but not binding. 464XLAT, that is an evolution of NAT64, solves this. That is, it, it enables you to do binding that was happened was happened to Skype. They wouldn't raise if they didn't see a, a, a IPv4 version. And that is done by 4664XLAT. And SIT data center allows you to go from four to six and from six to four, but stateless. It's much more efficient than the others but it doesn't solve the problem of the binding. So IPv6 device won't be able to do uh, the binding of IPv4, uh, And but I can mix them. So this is the path. This is what you have to handle an IPv6 only platform. I guarantee, at least from my point of view, that that path takes you to many places. And increasingly, thanks to the fact that IPv6 is growing, you have more and more IPv6 devices, and this path solves almost 100% of the situations. So it's good that here, thanks to our colleagues, we could approach um, and uh, give our views about each of those mechanisms. So. We have already studied it, so now let's practice it. I still have 15 minutes, right, Alejandro? 15 minutes? Good. Thank you. Let's practice. I, I prepared a practice for you to show you the configuration so that you may see how it works. Now, I used real uh, equipment with real IPs, both IPv4 and IPv6. I used VirtualBox. Um, uh, it's not that uh, it's better than uh, the other, but it, let me describe this. First of all, we have a border router. The idea is to replicate what an ISP might have. We can always uh, divide uh, the IPs uh, in uh, the border, the access to CPE, that is all, almost always maintained. But in an ISP, we have a border that is that separates the border of the ISP with the world of the internet, its providers. So that border has IPv4 and IPv6. Hopefully it's native. So this can be the same interface or in different routers, different VLANs, depending on what the scenario is. Or it might be some other uh, providers. I am ISPs have several providers. The idea is that the provider that the ISPs may have native uh, IPv6 providers. At least, based on what I've seen, the big uh, internet providers have uh, made an effort. So today buying capacity comes from IP with IPv6 uh, uh, capability because nobody's going to buy it. So you have your IPv4 and IPv6. This is a border router. And in this site, we are going to put a server 
because in spite of the fact that this can work for devices, it's especially focusing the servers. So it might be used for devices too, but with some issues. But I put a server and I called it IPv6 only server. Imagine that it doesn't have IPv4. And there I put different IP addresses. You know that a server can have several IP addresses. And in that server, I'm going to put a service. I'm going to prove with SCH, but it could be a web service or an app that's running there or an NTP service or a, a proxy, whatever service. TCP or UDP that I can think of, I can, I'm going to put them there. And I want everybody in the internet in IPv4 may reach that server that is in IPv6. So you say, well, but if you, you are in IPv4, how can you see the device in IPv6 without doing anything? Well, it's possible. And here we have the second component, that is the SID data center border relay. We're going to put it between the IPv4 world for and we're going to create an IPv6 world that not necessarily needs to be connected. This can be an entire network. This can be in the edge of the ISP, and this may be a very big network or as simple as that this server is in an interface of this router. Here I put a router that we call it an IPv6 only router to symbolize the fact that not necessarily does it have to be connected. This could be a network of 300 routers. This may be in a city, this may be in another, this may be in the cloud, this could be in a VPN. Doesn't matter, the concept is the same. The important thing is that the SIG data center has a side of IPv4 and another of IPv6. So let me read the idea. The idea is that the clients of IPv6 only internet may connect to the IPv6 only server. That is for this to happen. The IPv6 only server is seen from the IPv4 internet with uh, an IP address. Here I'm using uh, Simeon's uh, addresses both in IPv4 and IPv6. And it's also possible for the server to establish outbound connections toward IPv4. So we're going to solve both problems. Now, this is the IP address that symbolizes or represents this IPv6 in the world of IPv4. So let's see how we can do that. Let's see. First, let me explain how it's done. Uh, I recommend this technique. You, you, uh, what is the IP in the IPv6 side that you want to see from IPv4? Well, this is a server and this is the IP. In this case, one server. And then we do it for 20 to 30, we do the same. But let's do the exercise with one server that I want to see from IPv4. It's this IP. Let me underline it. So now let's go to the IPv4 world. What is the network that you want that server to see? Well, the entire internet. I want the entire internet. You know that the that it's zero slash zero. That is all the internet. So step one, identify the networks that you want to be seen. So I want this. 128 slash 128 always work based on the prefix. I want that prefix to see this prefix. This way and that way. That's what I want. How can I manage that? Step two. Look for uh, PIPv6 an address that represents you in the side of IPv4. The IPv6 only server here in red was only one uh, IP, it could be 3500, is represented in the IPv4 space with this in red. Think that we it's slash 128 that turned into slash 32. I just, mm, I, I need to have that IP available in IPv4. So connect the, uh, you, 
if a host uh, of the internet and IPv4 wishes to establish connections with the IPv6 server, only must do it through this 3887-235. Because the IPv4 world doesn't know any other thing, but I have to do it the other way around. This IPv4 address needs to be represented in IPv6 in a space. So it's very simple. A slash zero in IPv4 is represented very easily with a slash 96. In this case, I used a prefix from my network, 2803, etc., and I put uh, a slash 64. No, this is a slash 96. Well, I, I copied uh, this uh, prefix and I took uh, this from nowhere and all the space 0000 of ipv4 is seen in the ipv6 space with this prefix what does this mean that when the world of the internet wants to access this it's going to have to use this that's and when the ipv6 uh, our world wants to go to ipv4 world they will have to use this prefix that's a key all this is summarized in this. This is the key, right? Hago mi tabla. So what do I do? I have my table here. This is a component I use. This is a tool, tool from Mexico. This is a brilliant tool. And I fill in the table. This prefix is represented here with this line here. And this prefix is represented by this other line here. And this is how you fill in the table. And once everything else is solved, it starts running. So here you have a couple of commands for the server and for the translator. I, we use Linux. You can use any one. This is a dual link. We use version 4.1.5. These are some of the uh, specifications. These are commands for installing it. But in the dual website, all the documentation is available, very clearly documented. And basically, this is a module which is loaded at the kernel level. Then you have to have a start script so that it's at the beginning. Then you have the translations. And a very important thing is that these translations can be integrated. I like the tool of Linux because these can be integrated with the IP table. So I could do selective integration. I can tell Linux, the translator, just translate traffic from this part to the web. So if I have an attack, in some other protocol, this doesn't, it's not passed by the translator because it's selective translation. I understand that this could be somewhat technical, but it's better to have too many commands as too few commands. Then in the server, well, one important point is that trans, the translator has to enable routing in IPv6 only in the server. We could have some things, for example, that IPs to do only bind in IPv6. In the case of Debian, updates only for IPv4 as a plus, and then add addressing and then do the corresponding routing. Let us see this working in operation. I'm going to minimize this here and show you how this works in operations. So, let us look at the translator first, what you see here. Well, this is a table. Let me show you the table first, the translation table, which is called explicit routing table. This table has been created. Basically, in this Linux, there are two interfaces which are VLAN 830 and VLAN 820. This interface goes to IPv6 and this is to IPv4. And with the commands I showed you earlier, the table is then created with this table. Then any IP that arrives in IPv4 is translated to this prefix. And when it comes this IP only, it is translated to this server. 
So that is a translator. Once the translator is installed, it can be very easily configured. And then we have the server, the IPv6 server, IPv6 only server. This is a router, which is MicroTIC, and it has only IPv6. Now look at the result. First, let's, we'll see. Tiene, yo this le server, uh, I even entered the IPv6 addresses in a loopback with a loopback interface so that it can be served as an internal interface. And it has an IPv here, and if you pay attention, it doesn't have the public IP anywhere. And what I'm going to do then is to view the traffic. The traffic enters through this interface, which is VLAN 810. We're going to capture that. TCP dump minus N minus I, VLAN 810, IP6, and ICMP6 to show me these packets. So I'm going to ping from my computer. 38, 87, 235, and then here you have the server answering back. I'm doing ping to an IPv4 address, but the response is from a server which is an IPv6. Now let us view the traffic. When I do TCP dump, because this is a server, this doesn't have a graphic interface, but here, Imagine, well, we have, let us look up, I'm going to repeat, I'm going to start again. Okay, there we are. So here I received an IPv6 packet. You only receive IPv6 packet. And in this case, this packet comes from this IP. This IP here is an IPv4 address within an IPv6. So the IPv6 server says, well, this person is doing ping, but it's an IPv4 node that is doing ping that has been translated. So this here is the prefix, and this part here is the IPv4 of origin. It has my prefix, and it comes to this IP address. And this one responds from this IP address, and it, it answers back. So let us look at it more clearly here. Remove the N. Alejandra Momustan. So I want, what I want you to see is the translation. First of all, this is where it starts. First, you receive a packet from my, the IPv4 side, it's VLAN 830, and it comes from this IP. This is the IP of my Windows, and I'm doing this ping, and it says, well, I have a packet that is going to this IP here, and then I translate it, and here it is, has been translated. So this IP was translated to this one here, and this IP here was translated to this one here. So what you see here, is pure translation. I can also view it in the microtic. I can do a torch and I see that I have traffic translated on the IPv6 side. On the IPv6 side, I never see IPv4 traffic. I just see translated IPv4 traffic. So basically, this is what I had to share with you. I will stop here with this diagram. This is very important, and my recommendation is that translations are like this. They are vertical, but have horizontal connections uh, also possible. So basically, this was what I had to share with you. Once again, I'd like to thank LACNIC and all of you for allowing me to be in this space. I want to leave a message, which I summarize as follows. Everything has been done. There is a path to follow. Go to IPv6. There is a path to follow. Follow that path. You will come across details, but all these details can be solved. Thank you very much. And I am happy to take any questions. And there you have my contact details. It has been a pleasure for me to be here with you. Alejandro. Thank you, Jose. Great. Thank you so much. That was very clear, very well explained. And we have four questions, Jose. 
Well, I'm going to merge two of the questions. The first question is from Douglas Fisher. Uh, greetings, Doug Douglas. Great to have you here with us. He is asking the following question. These translations depend on the follow-up of the connections or are they stateless? And he goes on, although you need to do and undo the translations, can be, this be done in a distributed way with two or more devices doing this translation, same translation parallel to one another? Well, that's a great question. These are very interesting questions and I thank you for that. The first one is that the answer is quite clear. And that is one of the, the beauties of these mechanisms. Translations are purely stateless. And we could even turn off the tracking in the router in order to optimize resource use because some um, can be tracked by default. And in the case of the SIT data center, translations are at packet level. It is stateless. So that is my uh, clear answer. The second question is very interesting because it, it speaks about traffic distribution. Yes, it is possible. And let me go back to my diagram. If I could place in my network several routers without the data centers to distribute the load of that traffic and I can use any distribution traffic distribution mechanisms like IGP or routing with several distances or just any traffic distribution system and the three routers can have the same translations and one does routing for some packets and the other for other packets and I can even to have it so that if one fails, the other can take over. So the answer is yes, it is possible. And when your traffic load is big, it is also very efficient. It practically works at interface speed. It is possible to do so and it is even recommended. So I thank you for asking that in order to remind me of that. Does this answer your question? Well, yes. If you wish to add anything later on, I think we still have some time. There are three more questions. Now, let me read this. Second question from Katy Acuña. Good afternoon. What vendors provide SIT DC support? Good question. Fortunately, in terms of SIT DC support, some vendors or well-known brands for so, solutions still don't have this. Microtech does not have it. Huawei already has this. In the case of Linux, these are the routers, the Linux-based routers can use this mechanism. This has been a recent mechanism dating back to 2016, 2017. So support is still being in the process of maturing. But Linux, Huawei, well, Cisco, I would be speculating in order to say whether they have it or not. But if it is not available, it's probably on the point of becoming available. Great, thank you. Jose, I have two questions from another friend, Henry Godoy. And I'm going to join the two questions. The first question he states that if the border relay would add considerable delay and if this should be ignored and if you have comparative measurements, I imagine the delay with or without BR. BR. And the other question is that if you recommend border relay with just one network interface or with several network interfaces in the same server. Well, first question. The question is very, very high performance. If this mechanism is deployed in a router that has been optimized, if it's going to be used in a Linux server, and it is well tuned at the kernel level and it hasn't picked up processes that shouldn't be there. For example, graphic interfaces that uh, really provide, create vulnerabilities and consume 
CPU memory, this mechanism works at interface speed. If you add uh, things, it will do routing, but really there is no more efficient routing system as SIT data center from six to four and from four to six. And whether using one or two interfaces, I personally would recommend using two interfaces, one on the IPv4 side and one on the IPv6 side, in order to optimize the performance in terms of bandwidth. If the interface is a one gig interface, then so if you get two servers or 10 gigas, gigabytes routers, I would recommend two routers, one on the IPv6, one on the IPv4 side. But this doesn't mean that you have just one interface, this won't work. But because traffic goes in and out to the same interface, I would recommend this and the delay. I haven't done measurements because it's really very, very fast. It works at the same speed as a network interface. So the delay is negligible. And to close, because we've run out of time, Christian Hernandez is asking, could you block queries in the IPv6 only server from a single internet IPv4 prefix? Well, excellent questions. All have been excellent questions, and I thank you for that. We could even organize another webinar. I love these types of questions. Well, don't say that too much because really accept proposals and invitations. Okay, what I wrote here, and let me go back to this slide. It will take me 30 seconds. In the case of Linux, the interesting thing of this mechanism is that the space packet that I will translate goes previously through a selection. I said that previously. In the case of a tool, tool allows me to say the packets that you're going to translate first go through a filter. And I can say, well, it's not that you're going to translate every packet, but those who go through this interface that comply with these conditions in terms of protocol or MAC address, port of destination, port of origin, IP origin and destination. And after that, only those packets that go through the first initial filter are those who then go through the translation mechanism. So this is what we call pre-routing space. So in this case, you say, if this comes uh, through this list, uh, don't uh, pass it to the uh, uh, data center. So that's the answer. It, it, so thank you. I'm sorry, Alejandro. Not only is it uh, uh, affirmative, but it is recommended to be like this. So, so um, well, thank you, thank you for your time. So, I want everybody to have a, a good time. Now, don't leave something very good. There's a Kahoot. 